Good evening, I'm uh, Digbir Jais, uh, Vice President of Research and International at the University of Manitoba. Uh, welcome you to the second Cafe Scientific of uh, this year's fall season. Uh, these cafes are organized by my office to bring the health researchers from the university in the public setting. And we tried to pick a comfortable location and we found the bookstore to be that location. Uh, Today is uh, uh, a topic we are going to discuss today is the uh, topic on kidney disease, the silent killer. And uh, with your attendance here, you uh, have demonstrated that how important this topic you, is relevant to you and uh, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Uh, at this uh, point, I would like to introduce uh, your moderator for this evening. Uh, who would be uh, telling you more about the panelists and uh, some of the ground rules that will guide the discussion this uh, evening. Uh, Dr. Uh, Claudio Rigato is an associate professor in the College of Medicine, Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba. He is a head of uh, nephrology. He is also associate medical director of the Manitoba Renal Program and attending nephrologist at St. Boniface. Seven Oaks and Victoria General Hospitals. He is an alumnus of the University of Manitoba, having received his medical training with us uh, and obtained both MD and BSc Medicine at the University of Manitoba, and then completed MSc in Medicine at the Memorial University uh, in Newfoundland. He has been recipient of numerous uh, major research grants, acts as a reviewer for many prestigious medical journals, and has been recognized for his teaching excellence. Please welcome Dr. Ricardo. Thank you, Dr. Jazz. Um, and welcome. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to see such a fantastic turnout. I think this is our first uh, kidney health-related cafe since the And so thank you very much uh, for coming today. Uh, as Dr. Jai has mentioned, I will be your moderator uh, for this evening's discussions. And uh, in just a few minutes, I'm going to introduce our panelists that you see uh, uh, before us. These are all outstanding individuals, and each of them has substantial expertise in one of the more key areas of uh, kidney health that we're going to be discussing today. But uh, before I do that, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, how the uh, evening is going to proceed. And also to give you uh, about a five-minute intro into the issues of uh, kidney health, uh, a little bit of uh, a background into uh, what uh, our discussions are, are going to be about today. Um, so when we've done uh, those introductions, uh, the, the uh, proceedings will be that each of the panelists will speak for about five minutes on their particular area uh, of expertise. And then following that, I'm going to open the floor for discussion. Um, I'll be roving around with this microphone so that you guys can uh, uh, make your questions uh, audible to uh, everybody. We're a big crowd here today. I hope everybody, especially at the back, can hear. You guys okay? Thumbs up? Excellent. Louder? That's what? One more. Okay, now we're really resonating. Excellent. Okay. So, um, I just want to mention that uh, we are recording this uh, on video and that that will be uploaded later to uh, our website so that if there's uh, aspects that you want to go over or that you missed first time through that you can go back and look at that. And uh, there's also a photographer here who's been taking some uh, photos and those two will be uploaded to the website. You can see that there are refreshments right here, uh, the cookies are half gone, note to uh, those of you who haven't gotten any uh, quite yet. Um, and importantly, you'll notice that there are evaluation forms here, and those evaluations are very important to us. They really help us uh, in uh, making these sessions better, uh, so please fill them out uh, at the end and make your comments known. Um, I do want to remind everyone before um, we get started that, uh, you know, this is a discussion forum, and we're looking uh, for discussion on general issues and questions. Uh, it's not a great forum really to bring up specific individual health concerns, so uh, I'd ask you to keep uh, the discussion in sort of the general domain 
and uh, I may uh, even use my moderator's privilege uh, to sort of redirect things gently if they're, if they're getting too specific to uh, an individual's health issue. So, in the next uh, couple of minutes, I just want to take a few minutes to uh, set the stage and uh, get a sense of you uh, as an audience. Uh, I recognize some of you. Um, uh, many of you I uh, have not uh, seen before. And uh, hands up, and if you're shy, that's okay. You don't have to put your hands up. But how many of you know what the kidneys do? Okay, not bad. About half. Okay. So, how many of you know what the consequences are when the kidneys fail? About the same, about the same number, okay? Um, how many have heard the term chronic kidney disease or CKD? Fantastic. About half, maybe two-thirds. Uh, and along the same lines, what about kidney failure or dialysis? So, pretty good. So each person uh, is born normally with two <laughs> kidneys. Okay? The kidneys are about the size of your fist. So if you ball up your fist, that's about the size of each single kidney. Uh, and they're located in the lower back. In fact, some of you may have had kidney stones in the past, and you may recall that some of the pain kind of originates here, and that's the general location of where the kidneys are in the body. And the kidneys are very important organs because they are the regulators of that fluid that surrounds all cells and the composition of that fluid is very important for how the cells in your body function. So along with controlling salts and other things, the kidneys also control the total amount of fluid in the body and so they regulate by that and by other means, they regulate blood pressure as well. And the kidneys are also very important in getting rid of toxins that accumulate in the body as a result of metabolism. And if the kidneys aren't there to do that, these toxins accumulate and call, cause illness. They cause a syndrome that we call uremia. And this is, in its most severest uh, manifestations, requires some form of kidney replacement therapy like transplantation or dialysis. Right? So, Dialysis is, um, uh, or uh, kidney failure rather, which requires either dialysis or um, a kidney transplant, um, are significant and burdensome interventions. For example, someone on transplant, in addition to the surgery to get the transplanted kidney, will have a lifelong commitment to a whole series of medications aimed at preventing rejection of the donated kidney. If you think about dialysis, and some of you may even have direct experience with dialysis, uh, that in the instance of hemodialysis, a form of dialysis, for example, requires people to come in uh, to the dialysis unit at least three times a week to get treatment where their blood is circulated through a machine to clean it and then return to the body. In addition to being really burdensome for patients, it is also very burdensome for the healthcare system. Uh, it, uh, you, I think you can imagine that such a process is very expensive. Uh, Manitoba, for example, spends over $60 million a year to treat kidney failure <coughs> in this province. That's a huge amount um, uh, for uh, health care. Uh, and, and it's not a great statistic. It's not one that, as kidney practitioners, we're proud of, but Manitoba leads the country in terms of the rate of kidney failure. And this is something that I think as a program we have really consecrated ourselves uh, to trying to reverse. We would like in the next 10 years to actually reverse those trends and to have Manitoba come last in Canada in the rates of kidney failure. Um, kidney failure doesn't usually happen all at once. There are very few people that all of a sudden go from one day to the next from healthy to having end-stage kidney failure requiring dialysis and transplantation. Usually, there's been a long period of unrecognized chronic kidney disease preceding that. And there's a couple of things that uh, uh, are take-home points that I really want you to remember from this evening about chronic kidney disease. Number one, it's common. Okay? About one in 10 Canadians have it. I'm not saying they have severe kidney 
failure, I'm saying they have some form of diagnosable chronic kidney disease. So if in the store right now, let's say we have 100 people, uh, uh, perhaps even in this session we have 100 people, um, uh, about 10 uh, of those individuals, if that's a representative sample of uh, Manitoba or Canada, would be expected to have some form of uh, chronic kidney disease. The second thing I want you to remember is that it's silent. There are no symptoms until you've lost 90 to 95 percent of your kidney function. And what that means is that one of the greatest challenges that we face uh, as kidney specialists is diagnosing uh, kidney disease early. Um, it's uh, actually not difficult to do. The tests that we use are quite simple, urine and blood tests that are uh, uh, available and can be used in any doctor's office. But some of the questions around who should get the testing uh, and how often should we test are, are ones that we're actively trying to answer. And I don't think we have the uh, optimal answer for that quite yet. The last and the most hopeful message that I want to leave you with about chronic kidney disease is that it is treatable. Not everybody with chronic kidney disease is destined to lose kidney function and end up needing a transplant or on dialysis. Um, the, uh, perhaps of all individuals with uh, uh, chronic kidney disease, about one in 10 of those one in 10 individuals with chronic kidney disease will progress to kidney failure. And there are lots of treatments uh, that are available <coughs> that can be used to prevent or delay progression to kidney failure. And I think that this is important uh, for uh, us to know. So the main challenges that we as practitioners face um, in uh, dealing with chronic kidney disease is, first of all, finding it, diagnosing it, then treating it appropriately, identifying who's at risk for it, how aggressive we need to treat it. And then finally, because some people, despite all our best efforts, are going to progress nevertheless to kidney failure, we need to find strategies to make uh, the treatments less burdensome and to optimize their health and quality of life. Okay? So each of the panelists here uh, today in front of you highlight one or more of these important areas of innovation and research in terms of how we deal with this epidemic of chronic kidney disease and kidney failure. So let me introduce them to you. Get my cheat notes here so I don't forget any points. Uh, so to my immediate left here, Dr. Navdeep uh, Tangri is an attending uh, physician and assistant professor in my section, the section of nephrology. Um, he's also um, a member of the Department of Medicine and uh, the Department of Community Health Sciences in the Faculty of Health Sciences. His research program is in clinical and uh, translational uh, medicine and focused on risk prediction and improving clinical decision making for patients with advanced uh, chronic kidney disease. And he has uh, several active grants from the uh, Canadian Institute of Health Research Kidney Foundation of Canada and the Manitoba Health Research Council. So, Matt, do you want to wave to him? No, he's going to kill me. <laughs> so, Dr. Allison Dart is right beside him. Uh, and Allison is a pediatric nephrologist practicing at the Children's Hospital in Winnipeg, and she's also an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health at the U of M. She's an adjunct scientist at the Manitoba Center for Health Policy, uh, where she's currently involved in a project for Manitoba Health to determine the rates of chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease, what we call kidney failure, uh, in children and adults in the province of Manitoba, and to identify the characteristics of those affected populations. And then next to her is Dr. Harold Alkema, who is a professor of human nutritional sciences in the Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences at the U of M. And his research examines the effects of dietary components on kidney health uh, and signaling molecules in normal and diseased kidneys due to inherited disease, diabetes, and obesity. And that research also provides evidence for the physiologic and metabolic basis of dietary recommendations for dietary protein and for omega-3 fatty acids. And he's going to tell us more about that in relation to kidney disease. 
And then finally, um, Dr. Julie Ho is Associate Professor in the Department of Internal Medicine. Uh, she's a member of the section of Nephrology and Biomedical Proteomics, uh, as well as the section of Biomedical Proteomics in the Faculty of Health Sciences at UM. And uh, her current research focus is related to kidney transplantation and the challenges around failure of transplants, which is a big issue. She's working to develop different urine tests that can diagnose the condition early uh, in the injury process so that effective treatment can be started before kidney transplant scarring, dysfunction, or failure occurs. And the hope is that this could lead to a personalized medical care to keep, uh, or sorry, to help keep the kidney transplant working for as long as possible to improve the quality of care and the quality of life for patients with chronic kidney disease. So uh, I'd like now to um, open uh, the floor and uh, I'd like to have maybe uh, Navdi uh, start off and uh, tell us a little bit about what you do. Research and how it pertains to kidney disease and how I believe it's going to improve the care of patients with CKD or chronic kidney disease. So imagine you're at the Kentucky Derby. The Kentucky Derby is probably the most famous horse race in North America. And imagine you decide at the Kentucky Derby that you want to bet on the horses. So there's probably 16 horses running. So I'm going to give you two scenarios. In one scenario, you know that there's probably a group of five or six horses who've got a good chance and there's about five or six horses that have got not a great chance of winning. And there's about five or six where it's sort of difficult to call whether they're going to win or whether they're going to lose. Okay? In the other scenario, you know the exact odds that every horse has of winning. And you know this, and you know them quite accurately, and you can tell that this horse is a five to two favorite, this horse is a three to one favorite, and this horse is a two to one favorite. Where would you put your money? I think you'd want to know the odds. So I'm in the science of providing odds and probability for kidney disease. Kidney disease is very common. As Claudio mentioned, about 1 in 10 patients have kidney disease. But in fact, the vast majority, probably more than 90%, are never going to need dialysis in their life. But what's the most important question that a patient has when they walk into my office? What's well, usually, usually two questions. First question, why do I have kidney disease? And we often talk about it, the number one cause is diabetes, the number two is high blood pressure. The second question is, am I going to be on dialysis? And I strongly believe that rather than saying, ah, you know, you're probably not going to be on, or, you know, I think, uh, I think you might need it in the next few years, I believe in telling them, you have a 4.3% chance of being on dialysis in the next five years. That means you have a 95% greater probability that you won't be on dialysis. For people like you, this is pretty low risk, and this is what we need to do based on this number. So how do I do this? Well, three years ago I developed an equation that really accurately predicts the risk of dialysis in patients with kidney disease. Not only did we develop an equation and publish a paper like most scientists do, we developed an app for every smartphone platform and every tablet platform we developed an online calculator, and it's actually used globally to predict risk of kidney disease worldwide. So, what, what did we do since then? This was done three years ago. Since then, all we've done is tirelessly work to promote the use and promote better decision making by knowing the odds. So we've uh, shown that the equation's accurate in 23 countries, four continents, 700,000 people. We've shown that the equation improves decision making in many independent samples, and we're working to integrate the equation in our clinical processes in Manitoba, in Ontario, and in several other parts of Canada. Ultimately, all this science has led to, is leading to this idea that knowing your risk is good, knowing your risk is good not only for you, but also for your doctor, and that risk-based decision-making is truly intelligent decision-making. It's personalized medicine. It's where we need to go. That's my piece. Allison, do you want to? Uh, good evening. Um, I just wanted to say how delighted I am to be here tonight and uh, to have been invited to participate with this panel. Um, and I just hope to give you a little bit about the pediatric perspective. And I think it's really important to uh, make sure that we're thinking of uh, kidney disease across the lifespan. We often tend to focus on kidney disease um, when it's 
um, in adulthood when it's more common. The reality is that kidney failure is a rare disease in children. And that's a good thing. Um, in Manitoba, there are about 40 kids that either um, are being treated with dialysis or have a kidney transplant. And so that's a very small number of children. And so sometimes we forget about the kids, but it's really important to make sure that they're represented as well. Um, and kidney disease is very different um, in children. I think that's also important to realize. Um, children um, generally that progress to needing dialysis are born with some type of kidney problem, so a structural kidney problem. So it's not hypertension, it's not diabetes that's causing dialysis and transplant in children. And so uh, focusing on pregnancies and uh, focusing on risk from the beginning is really important in order to prevent kidney failure in childhood and also to prevent the progression of kidney disease over time. So you've heard that um, kidney failure is silent, that kidney failure progresses slowly, and that there are things that can be done to slow that progression down, but in order to do that you need to identify those risk factors. And unfortunately what we've uh, been uh, finding with our research and um, other research has found as well is that the risk factors that used to be adult risk factors are now starting um, in children. So things like uh, hypertension um, driven by uh, increased rates of obesity, um, increased screen time, increased processed foods, uh, lots of uh, different things that children are doing now that they didn't used to do 20 years ago are increasing these risk factors that used to be adult risk factors are now pediatric risk factors. So they're not contributing to NCH kidney disease in childhood, but what they are doing is increasing adult onset kidney failure. So if we forget about the kids, then we're forgetting about the early risk factors. And so if we can identify those risk factors when children are young, when, they're, when they can be modified, when habits can be changed, um, when treatment can be offered to children early, uh, then we can hopefully slow um, the progression um, and slow the rates of kidney disease in adulthood. So uh, my focus of research is in uh, youth onset type 2 diabetes. Um, which was a condition that didn't exist 20 or 30 years ago and we now again have the highest uh, rates of type 2 diabetes in children in our province here in Manitoba um, and this is very concerning because these kids are at the high, very very high risk of progressing to dialysis in their 30s and so we're, we're, we're trying to learn about why that is what are their particular risk factors um, that we can modify to delay risk in these high risk groups but also to look at the general population to identify risk in all uh, children across, across the spectrum um, and uh, to work with our adult colleagues uh, more collaboratively so that we can follow kids as they transition into adult care, um, which is a big challenge with pediatric research because we see kids until they're 18, then they're transferred to adult care. We really don't know what happens to them. It's very difficult to track and we don't have really good outcome data on the kids after they transition to adulthood. So working on these collaborations um, really will help um, guide what we do with the kids and hopefully uh, decrease the rates of kidney failure long term. Thank you. Harold, do you want to... Thank you. Um, and uh, I also am very pleased to be here, to be invited to be here this evening, and glad to see you. I'd like to talk to you from the uh, perspective of a research scientist who's interested in the role of nutrition in the kidney. I became interested in the kidney when I was a graduate student in nutrition, and uh, my supervisor had obtained the very first model of uh, polycystic kidney disease, a, a specific type of kidney disease. And we were interested in knowing whether or not, if we change the diet, we could change the progression of this disease. So we wanted to look really early in the, in you know, before you even saw to any uh, symptoms and any clinical signs of, of the disorder. So um, one day we noticed that there was a mouse in the in the colony that was quite a bit smaller than the rest, and. What happened to this uh, particular animal was that it had a, a tooth malfunction and the tooth kept growing and it prevented it from eating very well. So it was actually kind of restricting its food intake. And what was remarkable about this mouse was that its kidney disease was much less advanced than any you know, similar age. 
Now we've learned since then that you know you can actually prolong your lifespan if you restrict your food intake in a rat. Um, not something we really want to do. But um, we started thinking on oh, what could it be and uh, at that time there was some feeling that uh, and some evidence from especially from the European community that indicated that protein was, was one of the things that we wanted to look at. And so we did look at restricting the amount of protein in, in this model. Uh, we, we, re we reduced the protein to a level that was still adequate, so we weren't giving them a protein deficient diet, but lower than the normal diet, kind of like the, our average Canadian who consumes more protein than they really need, but reducing it to the level that they, that they need. Um, and what we found is that it could slow down the disease progression, it would delay the onset to kidney failure. So we were quite excited about that. Um, but then I graduated and uh, went and did some other training. But when I came back and uh, into the University of Manitoba and to, uh, started my own laboratory, I was still interested in you know the potential for diet to influence the progression of kidney disease. So we started looking at a few other models. We started to um, look at different types of protein as well. And through those studies, we found that some proteins seem to be a little better than others. So for example, soy protein seems to be beneficial. The other one that's beneficial uh, is also a hemp protein. Um, uh, we also looked at some oils, and we find that flax oil is probably one of the better uh, oils uh, when it comes to the progression of or slowing the progression of kidney disease, in fact, better than fish oil. So you hear all about fish oil, but in this particular case, I think uh, flax oil uh, comes out a little better. But we also, uh, as scientists, we want to know why. Why is it working? And so parallel studies to this, we have been looking at some of the uh, signaling molecules, or some of the molecules in the kidneys that are actually derived from fat and we call these oxylipins, but they're really just signaling molecules that in, you know, regulate systems in the tissue and you know, normal physiology, but also uh, involved in disease. And we found that there was a small class of these signaling molecules that was altered in the, in the, in the kidneys. And when we fed them something like soy protein, we could bring those molecules closer to normal, didn't normalize it completely, but it, it seemed to indicate that it was working by changing those molecules. And those signaling molecules actually gave us some ideas about looking at another part of kidney health that I'm interested in, and that's looking at high protein diets in, uh, in, in the healthy kidney. As you know, there's a there's often fads around food fads, and one of the things that comes and goes is high protein diets. And we really don't have a good idea of what a safe level of protein is in the diet. We do have recommendations, but if you would like to read through the dietary recommendations in about 150 pages on protein, and when you get to the nitty gritty, though, it really there's really not a whole lot of evidence for the, you know how safe is it to eat high protein diets. So we did some studies, and we actually, in this case, used a rat and a pig as a model, because a pig is supposed to be a good model for the human kidney. And we found that if, uh, <clears throat> uh, when we fed them high-protein diets for a long time, the kidney was actually very resilient and very resistant to damage. There was some damage, but in, all in all, I would say, you know, quite, quite resilient. And, and as has been indicated, you can lose 90% of your kidney function before we call it kidney failure. So um, the damage isn't really that great. But we also thought, well, let's look at these, these signaling molecules and see what, what effect the high protein has on those. And when we did that, we actually found that it changed the pattern of those signaling molecules. Now, the problem with that is that we don't really don't know what that means because these are fairly new molecules that we've discovered in the last 10 years uh, and have been looking at. Um, and we really don't know what, uh, whether that's good or bad. So what does it mean? We're, we're still trying to figure that out, but that's, that's what we do as scientists. We keep up coming up with, with uh, more questions. I guess for the average Canadian, what does that mean? It probably means that if you have kidney disease, 
probably want to keep your protein levels down to an inadequate level. Um, if you're going to restrict your protein, then you should really be talking to your nephrologist and your kidney dietitian to help you um, to, to do that because you really want to also make sure that you get adequate nutrition. That's really important. And if you have healthy kidneys, you want to eat high protein, I suppose you could. There's really no demonstrated advantage to eating high protein and there may be some risk. Um, and what we don't know is even if there's just a little bit of damage, what happens in 20 years from now when maybe you develop something like diabetes and it put, does put your kidney at risk. We just don't know those, the answers to those questions. But, so we'll, we'll keep looking. Um, for that. Thank you, that was uh, fascinating. Thank you uh, very much for this opportunity to speak. Um, I'm actually going to start with uh, an apology because I, I noted your responses to uh, Dr. Regato's questions at the beginning of when I prepared this talk. I prepared it for the general public, but I actually think that you're probably, looks like this is an audience that's much more informed than your average Canadian. So um, if at the end, um, if I haven't given enough information, I would welcome you and invite you to ask for more detail as you would like. But I'm interested in kidney transplantation. Um, that's really my, my interest and, and what I care about. Um, transplantation is uh, one of the ways in which we can replace kidney function once people's kidneys have failed. Um, it's really the therapy of choice for most patients that qualify for kidney transplant for three big reasons. With a kidney transplant, people tend to live longer, feel better, and they can be free of the dialysis schedule and the dialysis restrictions, which can be quite severe and difficult to live with. So for these three reasons, most people try and get a kidney transplant if they can. So even though it's our gold standard, um, and probably that the best that we have to replace kidney function, unfortunately it's not perfect. And there are risks with kidney transplantation. There are usually short-term risks related to the surgery, as well as long-term risks that are related to the anti-rejection medications, which is what I'd like to talk to you about. So we all have an immune system, every one of us, and we all need a healthy immune system to protect us from things that shouldn't be in our body. It's like a constant defense or police force that's always undergoing surveillance of <coughs> the body looking for things that shouldn't belong. So if it should see an infection like the cold or the flu or God forbid Ebola, um, if it should see something that shouldn't belong there, then your immune system will jump on it, attack it and try and kill that and take it out of your system to try and protect you from infection. For the same reason, your immune system is your first line of defense against cancer. If it sees any precancerous or cancerous cells, cells that don't look like they belong, it will try and attack those and protect you. Um, the problem is, unless someone has a genetically identical twin, an identical twin, wherever they get that kidney from, even if they get that kidney from a blood relative, um, their immune system will look at that kidney and say, it's not them, it won't recognize it and we'll think that anything that's foreign is bad, and so we'll try and jump on that kidney, kill it, attack it, and try and take it out of your system to try and protect you, not recognizing that the transplant is something that's actually good for you. And that's what we call rejection. Rejection can happen at any point to a patient. Within the first couple days after having a kidney transplant, out until 5, 10, 15, 20 years or more after having their kidney, they can still have rejection. As long as that kidney is physically present inside their body, you can get rejection. So one of the biggest challenges that we have in kidney transplantation is really trying to balance the amount of anti-rejection medication that someone needs to take. Um, it's kind of like, I, I have a four-year-old son, so my, uh, my, my, my analogies tend to be a fairy tale. So it's like Goldilocks in the porridge. Your anti-rejection medications need to be just right. If you have too much anti-rejection medication, you're at risk of complications like infection, cancer, and other things. Or if you have too little, you're at risk of rejection. So it's trying to find that perfect balance on the edge of the knife where you have just the right amount to prevent rejection but to avoid complications. The problem is, is that the way that we currently monitor kidney transplants isn't perfect. With our standard blood tests and urine tests, we can't always pick up rejection. You can still have it and we might not know it unless you do a kidney biopsy. Kidney biopsies really are gold standard and our only way to diagnose rejection. But it's invasive and it has risks. You can't keep putting a kidney biopsy in someone every time, every day and every week or every time they come to clinic, you just can't do it. So the major goal of my research program 
is to try and develop new diagnostic tests that can monitor for rejection in the urine. And we're doing this through urine proteins, or the study of proteins, which is also called proteomics. Our first major finding is that we've um, identified proteins that can detect rejection before standard blood work and urine tests can do so. Um, and this, um, our next step is going to be to do an interventional clinical trial with these urine proteins to see how they behave in a real life, real clinical setting. This has two important implications. If we can detect rejection at an earlier stage, then we can treat it earlier and hopefully those kidney transplants will last longer. The second important implication is that if we can detect inflammation or rejection, it will help us decide how much or how little anti-rejection medications a patient should be on. And that's what we call personalized medicine. Ultimately, my dream is, is that maybe we can develop um, a test, a, a cheap, easy to use um, urine test, like a dipstick, that patients can monitor themselves at home. Just like a home pregnancy test. If you can pee in the stick and the stick turns blue, oh boy, maybe I might have to go and um, I might have a risk of rejection. I need to see my transplant doctor and go get a kidney biopsy. Our second major finding is that we've identified proteins um, that actually predict risk for losing kidney function and losing their kidney transplant going back to dialysis. We can measure these proteins at six months after getting a kidney transplant and identify people who are at high risk for losing their kidney transplant 10 years down the road. This has three important implications. First, if we know that people who are at high risk of losing their kidney transplant, those are probably people that we should be monitoring more carefully, seeing more frequently, and just being more intensive in how we treat them. The second is, is these are probably people that we shouldn't be trying to minimize or withdraw their anti-rejection medications. And the third important implication is that if we know who is at high risk for losing their kidney transplant, then these are probably the people that we should focus on maybe in trying to enroll in clinical trials to try and see what we can do to help make their kidney transplants last longer. So I really had three main things that I wanted to share with you. First is that you know kidney transplants save lives. Um, unfortunately, it's not perfect is the second thing because there are risks to the anti-rejection medications. And the last is that my research program is really aimed at trying to identify rejection early and trying to identify patients that are at risk of losing their kidney transplants. So hopefully we can intervene earlier and maybe make their transplants last longer and make patients feel better. Fantastic. Thank you all. Those were sort of like micro TED Talks. They were really impressive and I'm so impressed at, at how much information that you all conveyed very, very uh, um, straightforwardly and, and, and simply in such a short space of time. Uh, so this is now a chance for you to get in the act and for me to do my Phil Donahue impersonation and run around the audience. Uh, I'll ask you to put up your hand. I'll try to go in order. Please help me out uh, if I miss anybody. But I'll bring the uh, mic. Okay, the question is how do you prevent kidney disease? I think the, the key to preventing kidney disease is to prevent, di prevent diabetes and high blood pressure. Diabetes and high blood pressure probably account for 80% of all causes of kidney disease worldwide, especially in adults. Uh, so I think you know, the remainder of the causes, unfortunately, are a series of uh, what we call idiopathic, where we don't know the cause, or inherited disorders of the kidney. So, uh, but I think for the average person, including myself and for all of us, if we can manage to stay away from diabetes and manage to maintain a normal, well-controlled blood pressure, it's very unlikely that we'll develop kidney disease in our lifetime. Just before that, Alison, do you want to uh, comment on the kids' perspective? Sure. So, um, because the most common cause of kidney disease in children is structural or congenital, um, having healthy pregnancies is very important. Um, we know that women that um, are obese or have gained a lot of weight during their pregnancy, women that have diabetes during their pregnancy that aren't well controlled and have high blood sugars, or women that take things they shouldn't when they're pregnant, like alcohol and drugs and things like that, all of those things can have an impact on the development of the kidneys. And we now know actually that if you're born early, if you're born small, you're born with less kidney, you don't develop any more kidney filters after birth. So if you're born small or early, you have actually have a higher risk of kidney, kidney
kidney disease long term. There's an inverse uh, relationship. And so if you can have a healthy start to life, a healthy pregnancy, um, that will definitely um, get you on a right start to avoiding kidney disease. And then also um, all of the healthy living practices that we all should be doing are really important to avoid all types of chronic diseases, including kidney disease. So if you eat, eat well, you have regular physical activity, avoid a high salt diet, all of those things um, are really going to have a long-term impact. It's because it's such a slow progression, you don't necessarily tie the things you're doing to your eventual risk. Um, so it's really a long-term effort to avoid kidney failure long-term. And that's really a fascinating concept, the idea that uh, the risk factors in disease are transmitted biologically, not genetically, but biologically, to the risk in, in the offspring. And that's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, you know, it's back to the idea that a healthier population will lead to healthier kidneys too. Is there any research that's being done or has been done regarding um, over-the-counter medications and you know long-term use of those medications with uh, chronic kidney disease? Great question. <laughs> Sorry, it's not a transplant answer, it's just a general <laughs> pathology answer. Um, so certainly there are over-the-counter medications that can impact kidney disease. Uh, pain medications in particular, like non-steroidals, like um, Advil, ibuprofen used in um, excess or inappropriate settings can certainly impact it. Um, there's other things that can make a difference depending on what their different drug interactions with prescription medications. Um, and there's also different entities called um, herb nephropathies. There's, Chinese herb nephropathies, where, um, which isn't really, you don't see it in Canada, but in places like Hong Kong, it's actually a very common cause of kidney failure, where people take a lot of herbal medications that may actually impact your um, kidney. The other thing to remember about Advil and, is that if you are on certain medications and take Advil with it, that can decrease blood flow to the kidneys, which can be harmful. Um, and also, if you take a lot of doses over time, that can directly injure the kidney. So you have to be very careful with um, Advil ibuprofen, that class of drug specifically. So you're saying Advil ibuprofen in conjunction with taking other medications, how does one a normal person go online or find out what are contraindicated, which medications you shouldn't mix with that or an ibuprofen? So the best bet would be to talk to your doctor, talk to your pharmacist directly. Um, there aren't a lot of uh, really reliable sources that I'm aware of online um, other than the pharmacy is really the best. Let me just throw something in here to please do, you know, uh, one, the, the little signaling molecules that we're interested in, some of them are actually blocked by aspirin and Advil type of drugs. And so we actually also did some studies where we gave rats some, that had this inherited kidney disease some aspirin and some other aspirin-like drugs, and it would slow down the disease. So there's two sides to everything. Um, now, don't go out and, you know, if, if you have uh, polycystic kidney disease or something, don't think we, want to you know, <laughs> we don't want to convey that message because uh, we certainly need to do more studies on that because of the very real risks associated with uh, non-steroidal inflammatories. And an additional component, and I'll, I'll just add that here, it, it wasn't directly a part of your question, but there are also many, many medications whose levels or effect is affected by low kidney function and so uh, again uh, that becomes another class of medications that perhaps isn't injuring the kidney directly but the risks associated with bad side effects or toxic effects from that medication really go up uh, quite astronomically as the kidney function drops and again to answer your question how do you find out about that I think talk to your care uh, practitioner uh, pharmacist, um, and uh, certainly there are uh, some good resources uh, online as well. Um, online, uh, you will get both good information and uh, not so good information, so you have to have your filters up there. But there are a number of, of good, solid, well-researched uh, medical websites uh, written for the late <coughs> that uh, you have access. Uh, I I heard, I heard statistically 
that like the heart is the number one killer, but the statistics are changing. In the very near future, diabetes is going to be the number one disease, and not heart and not cancer. So the question, I don't know if everybody heard that, the question was uh, heart disease is number one killer, but uh, uh, are we seeing a, a change in the ranking to diabetes being the, the number one? I think this is a tough comparison to make because diabetes kills through many other organs. Diabetes is a leading cause of heart disease, it's a leading cause of kidney disease. So, so I think it's probably very difficult to separate out heart disease not from diabetes and then compare that to diabetes. I think, it's, it, I, I think one thing that you point out that's important to recognize is that in Canada, in Man Canada and particularly in Manitoba, diabetes is a major public health problem and, uh, and I think the province is paying attention, the doctors are paying attention, the region is paying attention, and the public should be paying attention as well. That we all need to work on reducing new cases, reducing the incidence of diabetes, and actually diabetes is reversible. If you act early enough with the right amount of exercise, with a change in diet, with weight loss, diabetes is actually reversible. So not only should we be working to prevent new cases of diabetes, we should be working to also reverse some new cases of diabetes. So, so to answer your question, I think it's very hard to compare the two, but certainly acknowledge that diabetes is a major problem. Okay, two simultaneously. I think you were first. Most of them have all ones that are type 2 for diabetes and they have being obese. Just put the microphone. We have two members of our family, one at age 12 and one at age 15, who got type 1 diabetes. I have two questions. Can you reverse type 1 diabetes? And number two, is it hereditary? Great question. So, any of you want to take that? So, um, it's a great question. Sorry, the first question was, he is type can, one. can you reverse type 1 diabetes? So, unfortunately, type 1 diabetes is generally um, an autoimmune disease, so the um, pancreas no longer produces insulin, so it, it's a very different disease as far as the cause of it um, compared with type 2 diabetes, which is generally because of insulin resistance. So the body still makes insulin, it's just the receptors don't deal with it properly. And so often um, adults specifically that are overweight or obese um, develop insulin resistance first and then they develop over type 2 diabetes. So if you can target the insulin resistance and target the obesity, you can pre prevent the diabetes or um, even make, make it go away um, with, with lifestyle. With type 1 diabetes, unfortunately, that's not possible. Um, once you have type 1 diabetes, it's for life. Um, and it, it does tend to uh, run in families. It's not directly hereditary as far as um, one gene that causes it, for example. Um, but uh, or autoimmune diseases in general tend to be more common in families. We don't really know um, why that is specifically. Um, but often there are families that have more than one family member with um, different autoimmune diseases such as type 1. Um, I'm just curious what the impact of alcohol consumption on causing kidney problems and the impact on what you have kidney problems. So the question is, alcohol, is it a risk factor for kidney disease? Alcohol is not directly toxic to the kidneys. The lifestyle which involves sort of binge drinking or sort of uh, daily excessive use of alcohol may lead to weight gain issues, uh, may lead to liver disease, which can then cause kidney disease. And I suspect that if you have diabetes, alcohol, diabetes, which is the leading cause of kidney disease, alcohol can lead to more episodes of highs and low sugars, which can again be bad for your kidney function. So I would say uh, alcohol can adversely affect the kidneys through a host of indirect ways and not, not quite directly. Over here. Okay, so the question is, is there a negative aspect 
two diuretics, and the second question. <laughs> especially with the timing, we're going to bed versus uh, early uh, in the day. Uh, and the answer is, uh, you know, the diuretics, because I'm going to take one. Sure. I, I, <laughs> I could. I am the moderator. Uh, so uh, what diuretics do is they uh, get rid of uh, excess salt uh, in water. The problem with diuretics is that sometimes you overshoot and you get rid of too much and the body becomes dehydrated and the dehydration can then act through various mechanisms to reduce kidney function. Um, so this is always a balance. So, ma so many things in medicine are, are a question of uh, being just right. right? It's, it's a question of having the right amount, not too little, not too much fluid in the body, enough to perfuse the kidney well, have adequate blood flow in the kidney so it's not clamped down, so the filtration is not down. At the same time, you don't want too much so that you have too much uh, swelling in the legs, fluid in the lungs, and so forth and so on. Um, a, so it's not directly toxic, but it is indirectly affecting kidney function via its effects on, on, on the volume. The second question, is it worse or better to take it at night versus in the morning? Uh, not really, although if you take the, most, uh, the biggest dose at night, you're going to be up all night. Uh, so that's the bad part. Well, that's a good idea, but you know, there's no, there's no uh, great evidence that taking it at night is more toxic to the kidney. Um, it is much less comfortable. And for example, we routinely uh, advise patients to take uh, diuretics in the morning and then at noon, so that by the time night comes around, you're not you know, up uh, six times a night having to go to the bathroom, which is really pleasant. One more over there. You mentioned flax oil and fish oils. Um, have you looked at coconut oil? We, we have not looked at coconut oil. So, um, uh, the question was, uh, what about coconut oil? So we've looked at some different types of oils, but coconut oil is not one of them that we have looked at. Um, part of the reason for that is we don't, I mean, we, we're looking at these signaling molecules and we don't expect, and we wouldn't predict that coconut oil would have an impact on those. That's not to say that it wouldn't work on some other mechanism, but the mechanism that we're looking at, it probably doesn't have an effect. Wow, two hands up, okay. Um, you mentioned hemp, but is hemp not high in either potassium or phosphorus? Uh, that's a good question, um, <laughs> and, and you're obviously very knowledgeable about phosphorus. Uh, so what we did when we compared those is we made sure that our calcium and our phosphorus and our potassium were all the same, so we weren't asking a question about phosphorus, we were directly asking a question about protein. But you raise a very important point here, is that if you're you know thinking about, you know, looking at types of protein, you usually get phosphorus along with that, and, and depending on the preparation, there may be more or less phosphorus or sodium in there, and that's definitely something you want to look at. Uh, Harold, in, in follow-up to that uh, question, is it, is it possible that the type of dietary pro protein may be uh, optimally different in early versus very advanced that's certainly possible, yeah. yeah. And we tend to focus our work on the early on the early stages, but there's no question that it could. I mean, not very many people have looked at hemp protein, um, and we've looked at it in a very specific model. So, yeah. so I, I think that the objectives in very late disease are a little bit different than, than those in early disease. And I think that the diet uh, and the choices need to reflect that. Okay, I'm incorporating, like, don't eat meat every day. Uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, eat uh, corn and beans, it's a perfect protein. Uh, is that true? Could you repeat the question? So the, the issue is avoid meat and, and uh, take your protein from bean and other vegetable sources. Is that a fair paraphrase? Yes. Yeah. 
So uh, in relation to um, kidneys, kidneys uh, I would say that a mixture of proteins is probably your best bet. We don't know what the optimal protein would be, but we have done a study uh, in which we looked at obese rats um, because one of our, our thoughts was that if in, in obesity, your kidneys are also at greater risk for becoming damaged and, and developing into uh, kidney disease. So we looked at some high protein diets and we tried and we used different sources of protein, but one of the things we tried was a mixed protein source because we thought maybe we should do something that mimics a little bit more of how we actually eat protein. And when we did that, we found that that was actually, in that scenario, was actually beneficial. So a little bit of, a bit of both is probably your best bet. We get, always go. We always go back to moderation. I, I'm going to take uh, moderator's privilege and just throw out a question there that, that we ha haven't had before. But one of, one of the things that we talked about uh, that we introduced the idea of this epidemic of chronic kidney disease that's leading to these high rates of kidney failure. And uh, I'm wondering, just to, to uh, throw this out there, uh, should we be screening everybody for chronic kidney? What's your take? Uh, I'll let the other people answer first. <laughs> that's a deliberately provocative question. My world is a provocative question. So it, um, it depends on what outcome you're looking at. Are you trying to be cost effective? Are you trying to find every single person out there that might have kidney disease so that you can offer them the best health advice you can or as early as you can. So it really depends on what you're looking at from an economics perspective and I think Nav can talk a little bit about this um, too, but if you want to be a cost effective then screening the whole population isn't, isn't the answer. Um, but there is um, evidence to support screening high risk um, individuals that you know are at high risk of progression because dialysis is so expensive that if you can prevent one person from ending up on dialysis then it's cost effective to screen a large number of people um, and especially if you live up north which is where um, unfortunately we have disproportionate a number of people affected with kidney disease providing dialysis care to people in remote communities is much even much more costly than providing dialysis care um, to to people in a tertiary care center where they can just drive down the street to the dialysis unit. Um, so uh, we have done some screening um, in uh, northern populations that we know are at higher risk. And I'll just speak uh, about the children. And what we have found is a uh, high risk of risk factor, or a high rate of risk factors for CKD. So we haven't found a lot of children with low kidney function, for example, but we have found that 20% of the kids that we've screened have high blood pressure. One person because that's the prevalence in that population. You're going to be potentially doing things to 9,999 people that may have complications uh, in order to find that one person. So there's a trade-off there, as, as, as he's pointed out. Um, so it, it, it's a question of cost. It's also a question of uh, balancing harm, harm to people that don't have kidney disease or aren't at risk of kidney disease versus the benefit of finding it in those who do. Um, you pointed out some high-risk populations. Um, are there others? Yeah, I think the other important high-risk population, just to follow up on what Alison is saying, is in our work we found that the, the First Nations communities in, in Manitoba and in the rest of Canada and the rural and remote communities in general tend to have very high rates of kidney disease. And perhaps in those populations, screening is also cost-effective. But screening is also expensive in those populations. You have to take equipment up there and you have to have nursing resources. So it's not, it, again, it's, it's a trade-off and it's work that needs to be done. It's important scientific work that needs to be done in that we're working. Okay, we, we have a question here, or did you... Um, I, I can't remember whether this lady was uh, first or that gentleman. Does it matter? Yeah. Um, is there a relationship between uh, kidney stones and chronic kidney disease? <laughs> so, um, <Everybody's. laughs> so, kidney stones are very common, as, as many of you know. One in five of us will suffer a kidney stone over our lifetime. 
when you look at uh, when you look at kidney stones and, and kidney disease, uh, I think it's important to ref I'm going to throw out a concept which I probably shouldn't throw out in a public forum. It's the concept of the relative risk versus absolute risk. So. If you take two people, who one of whom has a kidney stone and one of whom doesn't, the one who has the stone has a slightly higher chance of having kidney disease down the road. But when you look at the overall population scale, their risk may have gone from 1.2% to 1.4%. So yes, your risk is higher if you have a stone, particularly if you have multiple stones or stones that block the outlet from the kidney. But the magnitude of the risk for the average person who has a single episode of stone is very small. I just would like to ask a very basic question, basic for you. You've mentioned the relationship between diabetes and kidney function, and then you mentioned the relationship between hypertension. Could you help me understand the relationship between hypertension and kidney function, please? So, um, should I pick someone? <laughs> yeah, you should pick someone. Julie, you want to take this one? Sure. So, um, hypertension is also a very common cause of kidney disease. Um, the type of kidney disease that causes something that we call renovascular disease, and it's probably the second most common cause of kidney failure. Um, I'm not sure if you, uh, does that answer your question? Or? How, was uh, how does the blood pressure yeah, injure the yeah, kidney? Exactly. How, how you, exactly. How does the blood pressure affect your kidney? Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it, it's probably through uh, multi, many factors um, in combination. Um, there are things that may uh, influence uh, the blood vessels. So if you have hypertension, you can have damage to your blood vessels that may damage the blood vessels within the kidney. The kidney has a lot of different blood vessels because its job is to clean the blood. And so by damaging those blood vessels, you may damage um, your ability to I think the other uh, point that's worth mentioning is that in the setting of a diseased kidney, an injured kidney, uh, that kidney is much more sensitive to damage from blood pressure than an otherwise healthy kidney. So if you have a situation where you've had chronic hypertension, severe hypertension, you've got kidney damage, all of a sudden now uh, your risk of further damage goes up. Uh, precipitously. And that's because the kidney loses some of its auto-regulatory ability, that ability to sort of protect its own turf, its own circulation. Uh, and that's why, and, and some of you who uh, you know, uh, may have experience with chronic kidney disease know that as a kidney specialists, we're very obsessive about good blood pressure control in patients with chronic kidney disease. Who is next? Oh. I'm asking maybe a silly question, but um, when you're talking about screening and whether we should have it across the board or just for certain high risk individuals, what kind of screening are we talking about? Like, what are the specific tests? So, screening, screening, the diagnosis, and staging for kidney disease should always incorporate two tests a blood test for kidney function and a urine test for protein in the urine. So we detect uh, kidney function by measuring uh, the amount of a waste product called creatinine in the blood. Um, and the higher the level of creatinine, it means the worse the kidney is working. So that's one test that tells you about kidney function. Then there's a urine test for albumin and protein, which tells you how leaky the kidney is, and that tells you about kidney damage. So you need to test function and damage together to screen for kidney. So I would say stay tuned because scientists like Dr. Ho and myself are keep looking for new markers. So she's looking at proteins and I'm looking at these fats, fat signaling molecules. And we think that they might become early markers of either change in function or change in, in pathology. Go ahead. What about sugar? Actually, just step out Okay, fish oil and hemp oil, and uh, maybe comment on transplant, and uh, maybe just generally on in, in immune modulation. Okay. 
Um, so what I would say is, unfortunately, in transplantation, there's not a lot of data, as far as I'm aware, in fish or hemp oil, unless uh, uh, Harold has any other comments, but it, there really isn't a lot of data in transplantation. Um, we do know that fish oils may have some immune modulatory properties. Um, it's been used in different types of immune types of kidney disease, something called IgA, but it's not something that we've really tried in transplantation. Thoughts, yeah, there's not, there's very little done in hemp oil. And I think it goes back to, I'm just going to keep saying the same thing, moderation, because um, there have been some studies done with fish oil and um, they might work, but, but only when you compare it to another more extreme <laughs> diet, and that's where it seems to be beneficial. But, you know, for a, for a diet that includes of multiple sources of oils, um, Fish oil probably isn't. We don't have the evidence yet that it's going to help. Uh, there was mention that there uh, there's more than one kind of chronic kidney disease. I guess there's many points of failure or damage. Or so, could you just maybe highlight some of the more differences of the different kinds of chronic kidney disease? So. Um, chronic kidney disease is really a spectrum of, of how severe, there's different stages as far as how severe the kidney disease is. It's really a kind of a, a catch-all term for all different types of kidney disease. There are, uh, as we've talked about, diabetes, hypertension related, there's also autoimmune related, genetic related. There are a lot of different types of kidney disease that cause CKD. And so um, a staging system has been developed which stages the uh, severity from one, which is the most mild form of kidney disease, up to stage five. And so the symptoms tend to increase as you progress along the spectrum, um, and more and more medications may be needed as you progress to the along the spectrum of CKD. But it's not until you're in CKD stage five, which is a kidney function below 15%, when you would be talking about dialysis. And generally, we don't consider starting dialysis unless there's severe symptoms of kidney failure. Um, and the symptoms at that stage are things like severe fatigue, anorexia, so no appetite, um, itching, severe itching, um, things like that. So they're very kind of uh, vague um, symptoms. Um, but <laughs> they think they're interesting. Um, besides, um, it's really at that below that 10% 10, 10 is when we would be considering dialysis. Um, but it's really all just a, along the same spectrum from 1 to 5. Does that answer your question? Does that address your question? Well, I just saw that there's like multiple factors in the kidney. There's the blood vessels, there's the cells itself. And it's okay. not just one kind of kidney failure. There's multiple ways it cannot be worked. The machine might right. not be working properly. Absolutely. Yes, um, and so most of the most of the, the common types of kidney disease affect the kidney filters, the glomeruli, so glomerular disease. There are also other diseases that affect the tubules in the kidney. So there's a, a kidney filter kind of attached to some tubes, and then eventually they all hook up together and into the ureter and drain out. Um, so you can have problems along the whole spectrum, but most of the, the more common types actually affect the kidney filters themselves, the glomeruli. So diabetes is the most common type of glomerular kidney disease. Um, they all, at the end of the day, result in decreased kidney function. So although you can start with a tubular disease, it'll eventually affect the other areas in the kidney. So um, when someone shows up and you don't know what type of kidney disease they, they had at the beginning, often you never know because it looks the same. It looks like a scarred kidney in the end. And so sometimes it's really difficult to determine that. Great, great session, everybody. <laughs> great session, everybody. This is fantastic. Um, I had a question that I've actually never thought about. I work with some of these people, so I'm very impressed to be here. If, uh, if I came in with a stage three, let's say, um, is it inevitable that I'm just going to deteriorate into stage one, or is it possible that you said I could re reverse my diabetes, can I go backwards and, and improve my kidney function? Fantastic. Now, <laughs> so, I pick on you. Yeah, so, chronic kidney disease is actually defined by, generally felt to be an irreversible decline in kidney function. That being said, if you stabilize your diabetes and take care of your disease, there's a chance that your kidney function may plateau and you may remain in stage three uh, for a very long time. Now stage three, the old stage three, goes from a kidney function of 30% to 60%. 
So if you had, if you were in that stage today, we doing using work that we've done, I could tell you what your risk is of needing dialysis in the next five years, uh, you know, down to a decimal point. Uh, there's also, you know, there's also calculators for more lifetime risk, but they're sort of less accurate. Um, it's certainly far from an inevitability that patients with stage three will end up on dialysis. In fact, the vast majority don't. And really the mainstay is management of blood pressure and blood sugar. And uh, so that's really the message I think we really want to convey is look after your blood sugar, look after your blood pressure, and you will almost certainly not need dialysis in your lifetime. One question back there. Yeah. Um, this question is for Julie. I'm just wondering, you're looking at studying the urinalysis or the proteins in the urine to see if there's any increase or in the rejection. If someone is on a biologic, for example, like for case, are there, other than the regular screening test, anything that you could be looking at for youths who are on long-term use of Remicade? Is there a pre-screening or maybe nothing at all? Okay, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, so Maybe there's repeat the question. Oh yeah, um, so uh, my understanding is that, so um, I'm, we're studying urine proteins, and so if I understand your question correctly, um, you're asking whether or not there's changes in the urine proteins that may happen with different types of medications such as Remicade. Yeah. Okay, um, so Remicade is a type of medication that um, modulates your immune system. So what I would say is the urine um, proteome, or the amount of proteins that are in the urine, uh, people have identified over 2,000 proteins that are in the urine protein. So when we're talking as far as you know, testing for urine protein and all that, the majority of clinical tests just test for one major protein called albumin. But out of those other 2,000 proteins, we think there are going to be ones that will help us identify changes in the immune system. Proteins that we're interested in specifically are things called chemokines, and chemokines are part of the immune system, and they um, help recruit um, uh, um, effector cells, they help recruit immune cells to places of inflammation. So it's entirely possible that these may be altered by immune modulatory drugs, because they're really proteins of the immune system. It's not something that we've looked at personally, because we're more interested in um, rejection, but certainly there's people who have worked in rheumatoid arthritis and other types of diseases that use um, medications like Remicade, and it would surprise me if there's changes in your proteins associated with that. So could you comment, are there like studies you, that you know offhand? Sorry, can I comment on studies? Can yeah, you repeat that? Like, do you know offhand of any studies that are currently being done? Looking at long-term use of biologics, and yeah. So um, one of um, so at the Manitoba Center for Proteomics and Systems Biology, one of the other um, scientists there is Dr. Hani Alkabawi, um, and he's a rheumatologist who has a real interest in um, the um, the prevention as well as screening for um, rheumatoid arthritis. And he does the same type of or he does not the same. He does very similar type of proteomic research where he studies changes in protein patterns in rheumatoid arthritis and he would probably be the person who is you know most informed about um, differences in Remicade protein patterns. Thank you. Yeah. How does the daily consumption of Tylenol affect kidney health? There's a certain type of um, it's a certain type of kidney disease called analgesic nephropathy. So over time, if people take a lot of pain medications, including Tylenol, they can get this analgesic nephropathy, which can cause kidney failure. So again, it comes back to um, what Dr. Kuhn was saying: moderation. Uh, I'm going to ask a, another uh, provocative question. I don't I, unless I see a, a hand shoot up real fast. Um, this one's, uh, again, Julie, just to keep you on the spot, could you, you made a statement earlier and in, in you said that, you know, um, uh, transplantation, or, or, or to paraphrase, transplantation is the best therapy for uh, end-stage kidney disease. That's my bias. I know uh, you're going for home. No, I know. I, you know, I, I, I think they're, they're, they're all good, but I, I actually agree with you. But maybe, uh, you know, flesh that out a little bit. Why, why is it better? And perhaps, you know, what are some of the things that the, um, the, the transplanters are trying to, you know, uh, promote and increase uh, kidney transplantation for patients with kidney failure. 
And so really, uh, transplantation is what I would consider a gold standard um, for replacing kidney function. Um, I'll use the example of hemodialysis. When a patient comes in for hemodialysis, they come in for dialysis three times a week to the hospital, and they spend maybe four hours on average on the machine. So in three times a week times four is 12 hours in a week. Okay? In 12 hours a week, we're trying to clean your blood, keep you in balance, and do all these things. But a real kidney cleans your blood 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Even when you're sleeping at night, your blood is getting clean and you make urine. It just kind of sits and collects in your bladder until you're ready to wake up and it's socially convenient to get rid of it. But 24 times 7 is like 168 hours in a week. What we try and accomplish on hemodialysis doesn't even come close when you think about 12 hours versus 168 hours in a week. So you can home hemo. Yeah, or even home hemo. So the degree of cleaning that you get with a transplant is much, much better than you would get on dialysis. The other part of it is, is a real kidney is smarter than what we can do. Second to second, minute to minute, in real time, a kidney will keep you in balance. And so it will keep you in balance by adjusting your, um, your, uh, like your potassium, your phosphate. It will do this on a real time basis. We measure people's blood work regularly on dialysis, but we have no capacity to do that second to second, minute to minute. So we're often chasing our tails. We may adjust things like the diet, the medications, or the dialysis prescription to try and keep someone in balance, but we can't do it in real time like a real kidney can. And the third reason is, is that we replace for on dialysis the things that we know to replace. For example, we give people back a water-soluble vitamin, and that's because as we dump out all that um, dialysis fluid that goes down in the trash, um, we're taking out water-soluble vitamins at the same time. And so we have to replace that by a pill. But we're only replacing for the things that we understand as a profession that we need to replace. And, you know, there's things that that kidney does that I'm sure as a profession we still don't know yet because we're not correcting for everything. So because a real kidney will clean your blood better, people tend to live longer, they feel better. Like there's just, there's so many reasons why, you know, kidney transplantations are going to Fewer pills. Pardon? Fewer pills. Fewer pills. All the dialysis.